Indonesia, Iowa, Romania, Germany, Florida, Long Island, Belgium, Montenegro, Serbia, New Jersey, Germany, Ukraine, Chile, Ireland, UK, Macedonia. That is awesome. Thank you guys so much. I've been to all of those places on my bicycle. Turkey, Latvia, been there, been there. Croatia, been there. Sweden, Argentina. I have not been to Argentina. I want to go to Argentina. Uh, Ireland, Croatia, Turkey, Nova Scotia, India. I haven't been to India, but that's another place I want to go. The world is a big place, especially when you're traveling on a bicycle. All right. So um, it's a little bit after 11 here in Southern California, where I am right now. Um, there's, I know some people are probably still just kind of straggling in, but um, I want to begin on time because I have a lot to talk about today. And I also want to um, schedule enough time to answer your guys' questions um, so I can help you conduct your own dream bike tour, wherever that happens to be in the world. So let me begin by <laughs> first introducing myself. Um, for those of you who maybe don't know me, because I know some of you have been following me for years, some of you maybe have just recently discovered Bicycle Touring Pro in the last couple months, and some of you may be just discovering me right now. Um, so let me introduce myself. My name is Darren Alf, and uh, I am the founder of BicycleTouringPro.com. For the last 16 and almost 17 years now, uh, I have been riding my bicycle around the world, and for the last oh, eight, nine, a little over nine years, I have been running the website at BicycleTouringPro.com and teaching people like you how to conduct their own bicycle touring adventures, whether you want to ride your bike, do a short little day trip near your home, or conduct a long, multi-month long adventure all the way around the world. Uh, and everything in between, from you know one to two week long cycling holidays to several month long vacations. So um, that is kind of who I am and what I do. I've written four books about bicycle touring that are very popular um, and have helped thousands of people conduct their own bicycle tours. And every single month, about depending on whether I have the time and internet access, depending on where I am in the world. Uh, I try to do one of these webinars, um, a free webinar where I discuss a particular subject. And I've talked about, oh, I don't know, the biggest mistakes that first-time bicycle tourists make um, and, you know, how to avoid those mistakes. I've done a webinar on, um, oh gosh, all sorts of things, the technical size, touring bicycles, the type of bike that you want to ride, the gear that you need to use. I've done webinars on bad advice that other bicycle tourists give to other people. Um, so all of those videos, in addition to this one that I'm gonna be recording today, are on my Bicycle Train Pro YouTube channel um, and also on the BicycleTrainPro.com website. So I encourage you to check those out. There's tons of awesome free information out there that I've put out um, in addition to the 400 plus other videos that I've created here on the Bicycle Train Pro YouTube channel to either help or inspire you to conduct your own bicycle tours. So that's a little bit of who I am. Um, and like I said, I'm gonna be talking about how to overcome your fears. I'm gonna be talking about seven of the main fears that people have that I receive on a near daily basis, uh, emails and messages that people send me about the fears that they have when conducting a bike tour of any kind. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, after I do that, I'm going to um, open it up for Q&A. So if you have a question that you want to ask me about bicycle touring or world travel or whatever, um, this is your opportunity. I will be taking some time after I give my little presentation about how to overcome your fears, I'll be taking some time to answer your questions. So I hope you'll stay around for that because usually that's kind of the most fun part of this entire webinar. Um, but first, I want to talk about overcoming your fears. And I don't think I can talk about this subject before I first explain, like, why people go on bike tours in the first place. Like, that's very important. 
And one of the things that I have learned over the years is that people have very different motivations for why they go bicycle touring. Like the motivations are different for each person. Um, people go bike touring to do something new, to experience places in the world that they've never been to before, to learn about new parts of the world, to get the history. Um, people go bike touring to try new foods or try new drinks. They go bike touring to meet new people, make new friends. Um, some people go bicycle train to get away from the world and just to have some time to themselves. Other people go bike train to learn about um, new societies, new ways of thinking, new ways of approaching life. Um, some people go bike train to get into nature or to share a unique experience with their loved one or a friend. Um, there are so many reasons. Some people go bike train to lose weight or to get into shape to accomplish something that is physically or mentally challenging. Uh, and a lot of people just go on a cycling holiday to recoup uh, from their lives, a vacation, basically. So all of those reasons, and there's probably a million more, are why people go bicycle touring. So I'd encourage you right now to, to think for just a moment, like, what is it that maybe excites me or about traveling by bike? Um, because I think you're probably unique in a way, you know? Um, maybe some of those things that I just mentioned uh, apply to you, but there's probably some other motivator as well. And, and it's kind of good to know what you want out of your bicycle tour because that will help you plan and prepare for the trip that you want to make. Um, there are tons of different types of bicycle touring. And I've talked about this a lot in the past. I talk about it inside my book, The Bicycle Touring Blueprint, which I'll show to you here. Um, in the book, I talk about the various types of bicycle touring. Um, and, and I talk about that right at the beginning of the book because it's very important because the type of bike tour that you conduct determines the type of bike you ride, the gear you use, and how you approach your trip. And these motivations, what is your motivation for the tour, is also going to affect not only the gear you use, but maybe the way that you travel, how many miles you cover in a single day, or which attractions you choose to go to. So um, it's very good to think about this at the beginning of the trip. And I, and I also um, need to throw out the disclaimer that like, I know some people here want to go on bike tours that are just a weekend long. And some people here want to go on a two week holiday in Europe or in Asia. Uh, and other people want to go on a two year long bike tour all the way around the world. Um, so it's a little difficult for me to, to cover all of the basis in one webinar, but I just wanted to say, um, yeah, I just want to acknowledge the fact that there are different types of bike terrain. Every person has their own motivation. And um, yeah, so one of the things when it comes to overcoming your fears, like, like people want to go on this dream bike tour, whatever it is, right? You have an idea for what you want to do. Um, but as soon as people have that idea, usually they immediately come up with several things that they're afraid of that could potentially prevent them from going on the trip. And um, that's normal, I think. Like, and, I, and I'll share with you in just a moment some of the things that I was afraid of when I first started bike touring. And frankly, there are certain things that I'm still afraid of after 16 or 17 years of bike touring. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. But I think one of the, the most interesting and maybe m one of the mm, best, most motivating things that I can tell you today is that like, like if you think about mountain bikers, or not mountain bikers, sorry, mountain climbers, people that climb giant mountains, like 20,000 feet, and they, you know, there's Everest and that sort of thing. Um, like the people that do that and then write books about their adventures or, you know, continue to climb mountains their entire lives, like those people and those books are, are filled with stories not of rainbows and sunshine like people they mountain climbers do not climb mountains because it's going to be rainbows and butterflies uh you know those stories of mountain climbers are filled with misery and hunger and cold and snow and frostbite and difficulty breathing but the mountain the mountain climbers reach the summit they don't get up there and go oh gosh this is the worst thing i've ever done uh, i'm never doing this again they reach the top and realize this is one of the best things I've ever done, and I want to do this again. 
despite all of the challenges and fears that they had to overcome uh, along the way. And I think the same is true for bicycle touring. Like, if you wanted a totally enjoyable experience where you just sat on your butt and everything, you know, food was plopped into your mouth or whatever, um, you'd go on a cruise maybe or something. But um, bicycle touring is a different, you know, you're on a bike and, and you're self-supported for the most part and you, have, you are the motor that pushes you forward. So um, in a way, the struggle, the misery, the challenges that you're going to face on your bike tour are the reason you should go bike touring in the first place. Make sense? Um, when I first started bicycle touring, uh, this is, I'm going to share something kind of personal with you here, but um, like I have struggled with social anxiety my entire life. Like when I was in kindergarten, I was that kid that was like grabbing onto the door or the poles outside of the classroom and like not letting go because I did not want to go inside the classroom and talk to the other kids or confront the teacher. Um, even in high school or college, like I, I did not talk to anyone. Like I was very antisocial and scared of people basically. Like I did not want to be around people. I remember in elementary school, like all the kids and all the boys in my class would go and play basketball um, at recess. And I would just go and shoot hoops all by myself, you know, off to the side. And, um, and so when I was 17 years old, uh, I was about to graduate from high school and I was thinking like to myself at the time, I was like, I want to do something big and momentous before I go off to college. And that's when one of my friends said, as a joke to me, he's like, you should run across America like Forrest Gump. I, I like to run it. And I, I was the first person from my school to run four years of varsity track. So that's where the, um, the suggestion came from. And I also like the movie Forrest Gump. So my friend said, you should run across America like Forrest Gump. And I started thinking about it. And to make a long story short, I didn't run across America, but I rode my bike. I rode my bike from Oregon to Mexico down the California coastline. And that was my first big bike tour. But it was also the first time in my life ever at age 17 that I had been away from my parents for more than like three days. Um, and, and not only that, but I was struggling with severe social anxiety at the time, um, just being around other people. Um, it's hard to explain if you don't know what social anxiety is like, it's hard to, it sounds so silly, but like um, if you go, if I, I would go into a bank and the teller would say, can you sign your name on this? I would have a hard time doing it because of my social anxiety um, or standing in line or anything really talking to strangers. And so um, not only was doing that first bike tour for me like a big deal just as a 17 year old, just as um, someone who's going out on his own for the very first time in his whole life, but I was also struggling with severe social anxiety. But after I completed that trip, successfully without any issues, um, I realized that the bike trip by itself forced me to overcome the fears that I had, the social anxiety fears that I had. And since then, um, since 2001, when I did my first bike tour, I have continued to bike tour all around the world. And my social anxiety has gone from where I can't even talk to anybody um, to where now I'm conducting a webinar in front of hundreds of people potentially all around the world. I mean, I, it's hard to explain just how bad my social anxiety used to be, but like if I was going to do this webinar even just a few years ago, I would not sleep for several days before the trip, before the webinar. Um, even sending out emails and stuff made me nervous. So um, I think the thing that has allowed me or given me the most personal growth is my bike tours because they have forced me to overcome so many of the fears that I have had uh, my entire life. And so, um, yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's normal to have fears, whatever your fear is. You probably have different fears maybe than someone else, but um, you shouldn't let that stop you and I hope it doesn't. And so that's kind of my main goal today with this webinar is to get you to realize that, okay, yeah, some of these fears maybe even are justified, um, but I hope they don't stop you because I think the biggest fear that a lot of people have 
is that they're not going to do the things that they want to do in life because of a small fear or a big one. Um, so yeah. Anyways, I rambled on there a little bit. I hope that made sense. So I want to talk about seven of the biggest fears that people have, um, or at least these are the seven fears that I get emailed about all the time that people bring up. And I'm sure there are other ones. And if you want to discuss the others after I've finished here, that would be great. Um, but first, let me start with the seven biggest fears that people have when they first start planning a bicycle tour of any kind. Number one, the unknown. Um, yeah, the unknown. Like a lot of people, you're stuck in your normal life. Like you, li you live in a certain place, you go to work, you go to certain stores or whatever, and you are very familiar with where you live. But when you go on a bike tour, generally, you're going to some place that you've never been before. And that can be a little scary. Don't know what it's going to be like. You don't know what the people are like. You don't know what the landscape is like, whether it's going to be hilly or flat. Uh, you don't know if you're going to be able to get the food that you're accustomed to. And so, yes, the unknown is a little scary, but it's also exciting. Like that, I think, is the most, uh, one of the most, at least, uh, interesting and best reasons to go bicycle train is to discover some unknown place. And I think that's why I continue to go bike train and why I continue to uh, go to places that I've never been to before because uh, it's exciting, although a little scary at first, um, to get out there and to explore the unknown. So um, I don't know. I think even after 17 years of bike touring, I'm still afraid of this one a little bit because um, I'm planning my own I'm leaving in less than a week on a on a, my own bike tour where I'm going to be gone to a place I've never been to in the world, and yeah, it's uh, I think the unknown is something that I always think about on any um, you know trip to a new place. Is what's it going to be like? You know, am I going to like it? Am I not? Um, so just know that it's normal. The unknown, um, yeah. Number two, being alone. That's a big fear for a lot of people. Um, and I understand that one as well. I have friends, for example, like I'm an introvert and I kind of enjoy being alone, but I also have friends that are extroverted and they can't be alone for five minutes. So uh, I understand where, where that they're coming from. Um, the, the good thing about bicycle touring is that it is an activity that can be done alone or with other people. Um, and if you're afraid of being alone or you don't want to be alone on a bike tour, there are plenty of ways to not go alone. There are uh, guided and self-guided tour groups that you can join. Um, if you go to the website at gobicycleterrain.com, you'll find over a thousand of these guided or self-guided bike tours um, all around the world. And these are usually like organized group tours where they companies, local companies, take you out on the best route in their area. Um, some of those trips give you food and lodging and all that kind of stuff. And many of them, the group tours at least, um, allow you to interact with other people of, of similar interests. So if you're afraid of being alone, that's definitely a good way to approach that problem. Obviously, uh, if you're doing a self-supported tour where you're planning to travel by yourself, um, there are also ways to find travel partners. Um, there are message boards on the internet where you can search for people who are doing similar things. You might, I think the best way to find someone to travel with is to reach out through your personal network of, of people that you know, friends, family members, coworkers, etc. cetera. Um, I think it's usually better, not always, to travel with someone you know so that you kind of know if um, you're going to get along with them or not. Um, but yeah, so there's that option. And also, I think, and I've mentioned this in previous webinars, um, I don't think you should let being alone stop you from going on a bike tour. When I went on my second bike tour at the age of 18, I was planning to go across America on the Trans, um, Trans American, ah, I'm blanking on the name of it. Anyways, the, the cross country route across <laughs> America. And, um, and, and I was contacting everybody I knew 
to see who would want to go with me. And I just could not find anyone who could take off the time from work or school or whatever to go on this trip with me. And I realized at the time, like, I could either wait another year maybe and maybe I can find someone to go with me. But, but the problem with that is if you do that, you could be waiting for years and years and years for someone to go with you and then you never actually do the thing that you wanted to do. So I realized at that time, like, I'm not going to wait around for other people to dictate how I live my life. I'm just going to go and do what I want to do. And so I went out at age 18 and cycled across America. And I think it was one of the best things I ever did from a learning and personal growth experience, um, not to mention the awesome cycling that I did along the way. So um, those are maybe three of my tips for being alone is like consider joining a tour group find someone to go with you, or don't let being alone scare you because it's totally possible to go on a bike trip alone. I see hundreds of solo bike tourists each and every year all around the world. Um, there's lots of people out there doing it, and you'll be surprised at just how inviting people are around the world uh, when you are alone to invite you into their homes or, um, or whatever, so into their social circles, etc. So that's fear number two, being alone. Fear number three is another good one, and I think it's a legitimate one, is the fear of traffic or being involved in some kind of traffic accident. Um, I think this is another one that I am personally a little bit afraid of, uh, even after 17 years, and, and there's good reason why. I mean, if you... Uh, are, I should s start by saying, like, if you are afraid of riding in traffic or, like, you, do, you know already that you don't like riding in the street next to cars and trucks, um, consider, one, there are places in the world where you can cycle for very long distances on dedicated bike paths. Europe, for example, is a great place to go. Um, there are paths like the Katy Trail here in America. Um, that are, that are great to do. The Natchez Trace is another good one, um, et cetera. Yeah, and so like you can find one of these uh, paths in the world where you can conduct a week-long bike tour or whatever without ever having to go in the road practically. Um, so that's one option. The other option is to go on a guided or self-guided tour like I mentioned previously. Go to gobicycletouring.com and you'll find a whole list of guided or self-guided tours the good thing about doing a tour like this is that these companies have designed their routes in such a way that they take you on the least traveled roads so that you are as safe as humanly possible. Like I just did a tour in um, uh, southern Portugal recently with a company called Live Love Ride. And um, they took you on a series of like dirt and gravel roads that were kind of side roads but also incredibly scenic. That if I had gone bike touring in that part of the world myself, I never would have discovered those places on my own. Um, so that's always a good option. For those people, however, that are planning a trip where you are traveling on your own and maybe you wanna go a, a long distance across an entire uh, country or a continent or even all the way around the world, riding in the road where there are cars and trucks is a fear that you are going to have to overcome and confront head on because there is not any like one magical bike path that goes all the way around the planet, um, at least not yet. Um, and so you have to, you have to be comfortable riding in the road and, and there's no real other way to overcome that fear than to get out there and do it. Um, because yeah, there are certain situations where you have to ride in, in heavy traffic or on roads that have no shoulder or roads where there are big semi-trucks passing within inches of you. Um, it's just a reality of long distance bike touring, um, especially when you go on a big round the world trip. You run into every type of road imaginable uh, and you have to either know how to go around that road or ride straight through it. So um, anyways, traffic. It's a, it is a real fear, I think, and, and something that you should be um, aware of. The other thing that I should mention is that if, if you are a little afraid of riding in traffic, one of the best things that you can do is to get a mirror for your bike. 
Um, and I think I've written a lot about bicycle mirrors on bicycleterrainpro.com. So if you just go there and click on the search button and type in mirrors, um, you'll find the various articles and reviews that I've done for different types of bicycle mirrors. But um, I'll just say right now, like the best type of mirror that you can get is the type that is close to your head or close to your eyes. Um, because there are, there are two main types of bike mirrors. One that's like on your helmet or on your glasses that sits about right here in front of you. And it allows you to look in the mirror and very quickly get a glimpse of what's coming up behind you, a car, a truck, or whatever. Um, and these are the best kind, the kind of mirror that is close to your head, close to your eye. There are other mirrors that are down on your handlebars or somewhere else down on your bike. And these mirrors, in my opinion, are not as good um, maybe they're a little bit better from a stylistic standpoint, but because they're farther from your head, the image that you see behind you is very, very tiny. Um, and it's, it can be difficult to get a good sense of what's coming up behind you. You have to look in that mirror at exactly the right angle to see the car coming. Um, and if you have bad eyesight or something, that becomes an even bigger obstacle to overcome. So. If you're looking for a mirror, if you're a little nervous about riding in traffic, get a mirror that is up near your head, up near your eyes. I recommend the helmet-mounted mirrors. Um, that's the one that I like the most. Um, and yeah, there's there's a good one from Cycle Aware that has a good one. Um, and there's one called Third Eye, I believe, um, that's also good. So check those out. Okay. Fear number four is robbery, theft, and murder. First of all, I'd like to say that in most instances, you can cycle all the way around the world and never have to deal with any of these problems. Um, in 16, 17 years of bike terrain, I've never had anybody try to rob me. Um, I've never had anything like pickpocketed off of my bike. Um, nothing like that has ever happened. Now, that being said, I run BicycleTouringPro.com, and I talk to bicycle tourists from all around the world each and every day, and I do occasionally get emails from people who, who say, my bike got stolen while I was on a bike trip. And that is the most common thing that I hear. Um, and usually, almost every instance of when I say, oh my gosh, that's terrible, how did your bike get stolen? They say, I left it somewhere. And when I came back, it was gone. I talk about this in the Bicycle Touring Blueprint. Do not leave your bike anywhere at any time if it's not locked up or in the, in the trust of somebody that you know. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I can say about that. Do not leave your bike. I just got an email just like last week from somebody, um, a Bicycle Touring Pro reader who who got his bike and his gear, and he was um, bringing food inside of his house. He was actually at home. He wasn't even out on the road, and he was riding his touring bicycle with all the bags on it and everything, and he had gone to the supermarket, picked up some food, and he came home, parked his bike in front of his house, brought in like two bags of food, and then came back out to get his bike, and the bike was gone. Um, yeah. You shouldn't have done that. You don't leave your bike, even if it's in front of your home where you feel like it's safe. Um, yeah, you don't leave your bike at any time. Uh, what was I going to say? I, I mean, uh, the other email, that this, was, this happened a long, long time ago, and I've talked about it before, but um, it was a young woman who was going on a bike tour in Colombia, and she had just flown in with her bike to Colombia, and she was on the street somewhere, I'm not sure where, and I think she was going into a supermarket or something, and some person approached her and said, like, hey, do you want me to watch your bike while you go into the store? And she was like, yeah, that would be great, you know? And so she went into the store thinking that this stranger was watching her bike, but in reality, that stranger was taking her bike. Um, and, and so that's another big mistake, is like usually the people, not always, but oftentimes the people that come up to you um, offering help or assistance are oftentimes the ones that you need to be most afraid of. Um, and so like this girl, for example, like if someone had said, um, come up to her and said like, you 
can I watch your bike while you go into the store? She still should have locked her bike up. Um, I did that a lot, like on my recent trip through Africa, like people would come up to me and say, Hey, you can't, I'll watch your bike while you go in the store. And, and I was like, okay. And then I'd still lock everything up and I'd carry my bags into the store uh, with me so that there was really, you know, they would have to break the lock off and stuff. Um, and even then I was like going back and watching every, you know, I'd go and grab some bananas and then I'd go back and look outside to make sure no one was messing with my bike. I mean, I'd go grab some granola and then go back to make sure that they're, they're not messing with my bike. I have to do that sometimes in some instances. So um, I don't know. That's my biggest piece of advice is like, do not leave your stuff because um, you're making yourself vulnerable. Like you, that's the main way that thieves get to you is like they, they generally go after people that look vulnerable. Um, the elderly, drunk people, um, people that look lost. Uh, that sort of thing. So if you can somehow not make yourself a target, that's the best way that you can approach your travels. Um, one of the things I recommend is go to YouTube and type in like pickpockets or something like that. Like um, I watched a video recently of the pickpockets at the Olympics and they were there was all these videos of, of the pickpockets operating in Rio. And it's kind of interesting to watch those videos because um, not only is it interesting, but um, you can learn what not to do yourself when you're out there on the road or traveling in any sort of way. Um, and to be, a, to, be, to be aware of your surroundings. I think that's, that's really like the number one mistake that a lot of people make is that they're just not aware of who's around them, what they're doing, uh, who's behind them, that sort of a thing. So um, I, I don't know, I'd, if you, especially if you're going to a part of the world where you know that this might be a problem. Um, you know, there are certain parts in the world where you really don't have to worry about that too much. But other parts of the world, yeah, you gotta be on your toes all the time, even when you think you're kind of safe. Um, and yeah, it's unfortunate, but um, the, 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 the truth is that 99.9% .9 of the time, you're gonna be perfectly safe and, and nothing will, nothing and no one will attempt to rob you or murder you or something out there on the road. Um, most people want your money, not your life. And so I think, you know, there there have been stories of bicycle tourists over the years. I've only, I only know of two in 17 years that have been robbed at gunpoint or with knives. And in both instances, they simply gave up their belongings and that was the end of the robbery. Um, and I, that's totally what I recommend you do as well. If someone, want your stuff, just give it to them. It's just stuff. It's just a bike. It's just clothes, you know, get rid of it. So anyways, um, number five is animals and insects. So many people are afraid of snakes, bears, dogs, lions, um, that sort of thing. Um, and this is probably, I think, one of the more silly fears that people have, although I know that there are legitimate things out there. I think maybe if there is any um, more serious fear to have, it's, it's mosquitoes. Uh, and as an insect, um, that's probably your biggest danger. And obviously there are ways to avoid uh, being bitten or whatever. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but I just want to say that in 17 years of bike touring, I've never seen a bear um, at least not at the zoo, that wasn't at the zoo. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I've only once woken up with a snake in my bag. That's a true story. I have a video about it on YouTube. Um, but it was like a tiny little garter snake that had crawled into one of my bags while I was sleeping. Um, not a big deal. Uh, and, and even in places like Africa where there are lions and rhinos and all that kind of thing, what a lot of people don't know is that like those animals are behind fences. Like if you're just out there camping somewhere in the desert or something, there's not like a lion roaming around out there unless you've jumped over a barbed wire fence. Um, and so a lot of those fears that people have about animals and stuff are really not justified. I just took a trip to Alaska just three weeks ago and I was up there for three weeks and I was camping out in the middle of the woods there are more bears in Alaska than probably anywhere else in the world. 
Um, and I was really afraid at the beginning of the trip that, oh my gosh, there are bears everywhere. And honest, and like I've I've spent years of my life sleeping in the forest, and and I was scared sleeping in Alaska just because I've watched so many documentaries and stuff on the internet. But after a week or so of camping up there, I realized okay, that there's not as many bears around here as people are making it out to be, and and I don't think they're going to confront me during the middle of the night and all that sort of a thing. So I think this particular fear dogs and bears and stuff it's it's another one that once you get out there on the road you realize that that fear is not as serious as you imagined it would be anyways uh if you want me to talk about that more let me know um fear number six i'm trying to get through these quickly is not knowing the language of wherever you happen to be going and this is another one that i was afraid of when i first started bike touring but now i am no longer afraid of it at all um, I have, have been to about 40, or I, well, I've been to, I don't know, 60 plus different countries all around the world where they speak 30 or 40 different languages. And, um, and obviously I don't know 30 or 40 different languages. I know one language well, English, and I know German, maybe a Polish and Spanish a little bit, just enough to where I could say a couple basic words. But beyond that, um, no, uh, I don't know languages and, and, and that has never stopped me. Most of the experiences that you're going to have out on the road can be solved by pointing. You want, some, you want a sandwich, you point to the sandwich and point to your mouth. Like people know what you want. It's very simple. Um, you want a hotel, you go into the hotel, you, you put your head down like this and you say, I want a hotel. They know what you want. Um, and so that I think is probably um, very a problem that's very easy to solve. I think a lot of people think too that like when you get out on the road, you're going to be asked like complex uh, sociological or um, political sort of questions. Like people are going to come up to you and say, "What do you think about Donald Trump winning the presidency?" And yes, that does happen, um, but not as often as you might think, and if you don't know how to answer the question uh, because you don't speak the language, it's it's perfectly reasonable to say, "I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't know how to answer this question," um, or "I'm sorry, I don't understand." Uh, I I think yeah, you get over it as you go on. But but pointing a little bit of sign language, it'll get you through 99.9% .9 of the conversations that you might have while you're traveling around the world. Lastly. Um, Fear number seven, because I want to answer you guys' questions here. Fear number seven is um, running into some sort of medical health problem, an injury perhaps, while you're out there on the road. And if you have like a medical condition that you already know of and you're a little bit nervous about traveling, um, I would definitely recommend traveling with another individual. So that if something happens to you, you pass out or stop breathing or break your leg or whatever, um, there is somebody there to help you um, in the event of an emergency. So that is definitely true. Um, if you're traveling by yourself, this is definitely a, a fear to to acknowledge. And I, you know, I, I do so much traveling myself, um, and I'm very much aware of the fact that if, if I were to get sick or injured or something, I'm completely on my own. I will tell you, however, like a lot of people ask me, like, what, what kind of thing should I carry in my first aid kit and all that kind of thing. In 16 years of bike training, I've never once used a first aid kit of any kind, uh, not even a Band-Aid. So um, <laughs> uh, I stopped carrying a first aid kit more than a decade ago. Or, yeah, more than a decade ago. Um, because I brought like a first aid kit filled with all kinds of creams and wraps and stuff on my first couple bike trips and then realized I'm never using this stuff. Why should I carry it? And, and so now I don't even carry a, a medical kit or, or a first aid kit of any kind. But um, I have gotten sick out on the road and, and uh, the, the number one reason I got sick was food poisoning. I've, I've had two really bad episodes of food poisoning, once in South America and once in Africa, where I was just out of it for like a week um, and, and that was no fun. And I was all alone, far from home. Um, but the, the secret I think is you, you are around other people most of the time. Like if you can get yourself to another person, 
they will help you. And um, like I had, uh, I, I was sick a third time actually, I, recently in Taiwan, I had a terrible ear infection that lasted like three days. And, fi- and I thought it would just go away or something. But f- and finally I had to go to the, the person, I was staying in a hotel. I went to the, down to the hotel and I don't speak Chinese. Um, but I like wrote out on a note, like I have a really bad ear infection and I need help. And, and he took me to the hospital, got me in front of a doctor, told the doctor what was wrong with me, um, and totally, totally helped me out. Like if I had tried to do that on my own, it, uh, I don't know if I could have done it. I mean, I could have, but it would have been very difficult. And so there are good people out there in the world. Like you get sick, other people will take care of you. It's kind of human nature. So ask for help. You'll get help usually as quick as, as possible. Um, and I think the other thing, and one of the things that I talk about inside the Bicycle Train Blueprint way back in the third chapter is that as a long distance bicycle tourist, your goal is to reach your goal. Um, and part of that means trying to be as safe as humanly possible. Um, and keeping yourself safe in every situation. In the book, I talk about like how maybe if you're riding at home, like on a fast road bike or something, you might like sprint down a road at 50 miles an hour, go around the turns really fastly, et cetera, take more risks because you know that if you did get hurt, you're near a hospital, you're near people you know, you have a cell phone, you can call for help or whatever. But if you're on the other side of the planet all alone, traveling by yourself and you get hurt, it's a very different sort of thing. And so I think that's why uh, when I'm out on the road, I take a lot of precautions to stay safe. I I purposely go slow when I'm descending down hills. Um, I purposely, you know, don't lean into the corners as much as maybe I could or I should. Um, And it's it's those sorts of things. So, um, yeah. Anyways, okay, I've talked way too long. I talked for like 15 minutes more than I wanted to. So I want to um, take a moment uh, before before I finish, um, I I did want to say one more thing because it's it's actually like one of the best questions that I've gotten in recent months, and it's something that's starting to pop up more and more. Um, the question that I get is from people from time to time is like like can I go bicycle touring? Like I don't want to explain this in the wrong way, but I am a white man and from America. And so I get questions from people that say like, hey, I love your videos, I love what you're doing, Um, this looks like so much fun, I wanna do this, but I'm black, or I'm Latino, or I'm Asian, or I'm gay, or I'm Muslim. Can I go bike touring, is it safe? Um, And as much as I would like to say, oh yeah, the world is safe, most people in the world are good, blah, 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 um, and I think that is true for the most part. Um, the truth is, I am not any of those things. Um, you know, I'm not black, Latino, Asian, gay, Muslim, whatever. Uh, I don't have experience being those things. And I don't know if you go to a certain part of the world how you are going to be treated. Um, and that's just the truth. Like, I've tried to, I've, I've really thought about how to answer that question. And I think the best way to answer is to say, I don't know. Um, What I can tell you is that there are black people, there are Latinos, there are Asians and gay people and Muslims, et cetera, out there on bike tours right now. Uh, I know that because I run BicycleTrainPro.com and I hear from those people every single day, every single week, every single month um, for the last nine years. So I know that they're out there. I don't think their numbers are as high as maybe white individuals. Um, But gosh, I wish I could uh, make the world a a safer place so that this wasn't a problem. Okay, that's all I have to say. Um, I want to open it up to Q&A. And one of the things I wanted to talk about today was I'm leaving on a trip in seven days. And I'm going somewhere I've never been before, and I haven't told anyone where I'm going, and maybe I'll tell you right now before I start the q and I am going on my next big bike tour to Ecuador and Colombia in South America, and I'm going to be there for three and a half months or so, 
um, bike touring around. Um, and yeah, it should be fun. So I'm looking forward to it. And I look forward to sharing it with you, um, taking photos, shooting videos. So I hope you'll tune in to my adventure in Ecuador. And I look forward to hearing about your future bike touring adventures as well. OK, let's answer some questions. All right, so if you're on YouTube right now, there is a comment section on the right-hand side. Um, I'm going to go back, and I, I, I see that you guys have been commenting. Thank you so much. Um, I'll try to skim through the questions and answer as many as I can in the next few minutes. Um, if I miss your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to try to get to as many as I can. Uh, Lori David Merck says, have you ever been in a situation where you cannot find a place to sleep at night? Yes and no. Um, there was a situation like, I don't know, I was in Taiwan. This is the one that comes to, to mind um, just because it happened somewhat recently. But I was in Taiwan traveling with my friend Kevin, and we were um, trying to stay in a hotel. And we were on the western side of the island, southwestern side of the island, and we we're and it had been a long day, 100 kilometers or something like that, uh, in the hills. And we were trying to find a place to sleep. And we got to a town, and we could not find anything in town. There just wasn't anything there. We we spent oh gosh, a half hour, an hour cycling around town trying to find a place to stay. We went to the fire department, we went to the police department, and asked where can we stay. They didn't know. So eventually, we figured out that there was a hotel, I don't know, 10, 15 more miles down the road um, in, in like the next town. So we're, and by this time, it was dark. And, you know, I usually make a point of not riding after dark. So we put on our lights and we took off towards that next town where we found a hotel. And, and that was the end of the story, basically. But usually, that's kind of like the worst that happens is like you, you, yeah, you can't find a, a, a place to stay where you originally thought, and then you have to go somewhere else. That's usually the worst thing that happens. The, the thing I should mention is if you're bicycle train and you're carrying a tent or a sleeping bag, um, that really opens up the possibilities of where you can sleep at night. Because if you don't have that gear, that means you have to be in a hotel or a hostel or a bed and breakfast every single night. Um, and that makes it much more difficult to find places to sleep. Um, but if you have a tent or sleeping bag, you could go up to a stranger's house or go into the forest or um, go out into a, some farmland and just set up your tent for the night. Um, and so it, it really, having that tent and sleeping bag really eliminates a lot of the stress that may be involved um, with not having a place to sleep at night. Does that make sense? Like, I'm planning to go to Ecuador and Colombia um, soon, and I've thought about not bringing my tent or my sleeping bag with me um, because it's a part of the world where hotels cost anywhere from seven to twenty-five dollars. Like, it's very affordable. Um, so it's like I could potentially just stay in a hotel every night, and that might be what I do once I get there. I don't know, but I think I am going to bring my tent and my sleeping bag just in case, just because it opens me up to the possibility of staying in a very, you know, on a scenic mountaintop or next to a, a, a river or something, if I want to do that or if I need to do that. So, okay, I hope that answers your question. Uh, <laughs> uh, someone says, have you ever been locked in a situation where you had to leave a stealth campsite under the pressure of locals? So stealth camping is where you camp in an area um, that you aren't necessarily supposed to camp in or you don't want to be discovered camping in that area. Like if you see people camping under a bridge or something, that's a stealth camping location. Um, and I have done years of stealth camping all around the world, in Africa and Europe and South America and North America, Asia. Um, and, and the truth is no, like I have never been discovered in a stealth camping location. Um, and that is one of my secrets. I have a video here on YouTube called I think the 50 best stealth camping secrets or something like that. Um, and one of my secrets is do not get caught. <laughs> do not camp in an area where you're going to get discovered. So um, I try to go out of my way not to be discovered, and it's never happened in 16 years. Uh, 
Okay, looking for questions. How do you lock your bike on your trips? Well, that's a little complicated um, to answer because every day is different. Every situation is different. Um, it depends on where you are in the world. On my last trip, I just completed a three month long trip across Portugal, Spain, France, Andorra, Norway, and Sweden. I didn't even bring a bike lock on the trip. I went for three months, no bike lock. Um, and so, yeah, though, and the way I was able to do that is because I was staying in hotels for a large portion of the trip. So when I was in those hotels, I either brought the bike into my room or I locked the bike in some sort of basement or closet within the hotel. Um, and then when I was camping, I was camping in areas where I knew for the most part that I did not have to worry about anyone stealing my bike. I think that's one of the best things about going, I don't know, to like Norway or Sweden, uh, for example, is that you, there are, if you go out on the streets of like a, a town, almost any town in Sweden, there'll be like hundreds of bikes out on the street, unlocked, and there's no one stealing them. And obviously it's not like that everywhere in the world, but when you are in a part of the world like that, um, you know, you have, you don't have to worry about your bike getting stolen as much. Um, obviously the potential is still there, but, um, but yeah, for the most part, I lock my bike very rarely actually, because I, I very rarely let my bike out of my sight. Usually the bike lock goes on when I go inside of a supermarket. That's the main thing. And, um, depending on how much gear I'm carrying, I will oftentimes lock the bike to a bike lock outside or a pole or a tree outside of the, the shop that I'm going into. And I will carry my bags um, inside the store with me, depending on the situation and where I am in the world. Sometimes I leave the bags on the bike, but if I do leave the bags on the bike, the bags that are on the bike are the bags that don't contain anything valuable. Like I always bring my camera, my passport, my wallet, et cetera, into the store with me while I'm shopping. If someone wants to steal my sleeping bag and my tent and my food and my toiletries off of my bike, let them have it, you know? Um, but I do not want to lose my wallet, my passport, et cetera. So yeah, I, I generally carry anything that's valuable. I just don't let it out of my sight. That's, that's, that's really all there is to it. Okay. Um, Someone asked about visas. How easy is it to arrange visas when you're traveling? Yeah, so depending on where you're from and where you want to go, you have to get a visa to go to certain countries. And the answer to that question is I don't really know because every person is different depending on where you're from and where you want to go. The rules are different. There is no standard thing. Some visas you can get by just showing up in the country and buying the visa right there at the airport. Other visas you have to apply for three months in advance, send in all sorts of advanced paperwork, et cetera, and it's a huge pain in the butt. I don't know. I, you know, there, I don't have a good answer. You, that you have to do some research on the internet to find out you know, what the visa requirements are for you, uh, depending on which country you're from and where you wanna go. Like I, I wanna go to Russia, that's one of the places I wanna go, and I have to get a visa for that, and I have to, I have to tell them like where I'm gonna stay and where I'm gonna go, and, I have to have a sponsor and all this stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a pain in the butt. It's not a lot of fun. But, but the rule for me to go to Russia is going to be different than the rule for you if you're from, I don't know, Ukraine or Lithuania or Belarus or something like that. Um, anyways. <laughs> Goran Andov says, hello from Macedonia. I know you visited my country. Yep, I've been to Macedonia. I really liked it there. Uh, uh, I'm just looking for a good question. <laughs> Will you be the first to cycle Mars? That's a good question. I doubt it. I highly doubt it. That would be pretty cool, though. I'd like to try the moon, maybe. <laughs> uh, okay, let me scroll down to the bottom to see the latest comments here. Yeah, Carol M says, a woman traveling alone. That goes back to what I was saying just a moment ago about you know black people, Muslim people, gay people, or women. You know, I am not a woman and I don't know, um, but I have 
you know, I am well aware of the fact, I think, that a woman is going to have a different experience traveling around the world by bicycle than a man. You know, I, I have friends that are women and I walk next to them down the street and the interactions that they receive from other people are very different from the interactions that I receive as a single white man. So um, I can tell you that there are certain parts in the world as a woman that are very popular, like Norway, Sweden, Finland, um, Denmark. Uh, if, if you're a woman wanting to travel alone, like that is a very, very safe, in my opinion, place to go. Um, maybe despite what the news has been saying about Sweden and stuff recently, but still, um, yeah, that's something I would recommend. Uh, it depends where you are in the world. I, ju I just don't know how to answer that question. Like I said before, um, I'm not a woman and I, and I can tell you that there are single women out there bike touring right now. Uh, single women have biked all around the world. Um, I don't see, I, and I, you know, to be honest, I've, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I, I don't like saying this stat because it sucks. But um, in 16, 17 years of bike training, I've really only seen one or two solo women out on the road myself. I know that there are others um, out there because I hear from them on BicycleTurnPro.com. I get their pictures from the road and stuff. But I've not seen a lot. Like in over 16, 17 years, I've seen thousands of solo male men on bike tours, but I've only seen maybe two solo women. So um, I would like to change that if I could change anything in the world. Gosh, that would be that would be nice um, to make women feel safe um, traveling anywhere in the world. Uh, Darren, how would you change the tire pressure from unloaded cycling to loaded cycling? Mm. <laughs> I guess I generally have a little bit more pressure in my tires when I'm loaded. Um, and that's all I really have to say about that. <laughs> uh, Renato Martino says, do you think a handlebar bag is enough for a four day bike tour while staying in hostels? or would I need panniers? I think what you're asking about is called credit card touring. And credit card touring is when you travel by bicycle and pack almost nothing on your bike, except for maybe the clothes you're wearing, and a credit card or cash to buy things along the way. So is a maybe a large handlebar bag or maybe a rear rack pack, for example, enough um, for a four-day bike tour? Absolutely, and a lot of people do that. Um, you know, especially on short, fast bike trips, like it sounds like the one you want to plan. Um, it, and, you know, if you're staying in a hotel or a hostel or something, you don't need to you don't need to carry camping equipment. You don't need to carry a, a, a towel of any kind. Maybe you don't even need very many toiletries, just a toothbrush and toothpaste. Um, and the rest you can get at the hotels that you stay in at along the way. So yeah, just carry a small bag to maybe Put a rain jacket in and, and your wallet and off you go. Um, Castaway says, I want to take baby tours from Los Angeles to Cambria, but I can't afford camping fees. Would you do an episode on urban stealth camping or how to camp free in areas like San Luis Obispo, Cambria? Well, I, I could do something like that in the future, but to answer your question right now, like if I were to do that trip, like I'm, I'm from Southern California, so I'm pretty familiar with that area, and you did not want to pay for a campground, um, I would look into the warm showers list. It's warmshowers.org. It's a website, it's a database of people all around the world that offer up their home for free to traveling cyclists. And so you could get in touch with people that live in that area and just say, hey, I'm doing a little trip through Southern California, would, would you be willing to host me for a night? And I bet that you'll be able to find free places to stay in those areas, and you won't have to camp out on the beach somewhere and worry about the cops bothering you at night or something. So um, that would be my advice for, for you in this particular instance. Um, Marco says, I have one solid mountain, but oops, I lost his comment now. 
but he basically said he has a mountain bike and would that be good to tour on? That's a question that I cover inside my book, The Essential Guide to Touring Bicycles, which is all about touring bikes and why you need a touring bike. What makes a touring bike different than other bicycles like a mountain bike? And in the book, I talk about the differences between mountain bikes and touring bicycles. One of the things that I say in the book is that if you're doing a short trip, excuse me, if you're doing a short bike trip, then a mountain bike is a, is a good bike to do it on um, because touring bicycles and mountain bikes have a lot in common as far as like the gearing goes. Um, but there are some major differences between a touring bike and a mountain bike in regards to the handlebars, the um, frame design, the geometry of the frame, and especially if your bike has if your mountain bike has suspension on it, that changes things as well. So the the number one reason that mountain biking is not good or a mountain bike is not good for a long distance bike trip is that most mountain bikes, almost all of them, have flat handlebars, which means there's really only one position in which to to place your hands on the bike, just flat, straight on uh, on the handlebars. Touring bicycles have handlebars like drop bars or butterfly bars usually, um, which allow you to move your hands around into different positions. And by moving your hands around, um, you are able to circulate blood to different parts of your, of your body, basically. The, the danger of using flat handlebars is that when you ride for days on end, hours on end on the bike, you can cut off pressure in your nerves to your, to your fingers, to your hand, all the way up to your elbow and, and even further sometimes. And I had this problem myself on my second long distance bike tour. Um, I was using a mountain bike and it had flat handlebars. And after about two weeks on the road, I started to lose feeling and I lost the feeling all the way up to about here uh, in my left hand because the pressure constantly from being on the bike was cutting off the circulation to my arm. And it got so bad to where I was having um, problems opening food containers, like you know, a bag of chips or something. I just couldn't open it because I had no feeling in my left hand. So that is the big danger, really, for using a mountain bike. The suspension and that sort of thing is, is secondary to the dangers of nerve damage. Um, and so, yes, a mountain bike can be used on a short tour but I would not recommend it for anything really more than two weeks um, because it's somewhere around that period where you can really hurt yourself. Um, yeah, hope that answers your question. <laughs> Tony says, helmet or baseball cap on tour? I, 99.9% .9 of the time, ride with a helmet on, but um, I am not a helmet Nazi. Um, I am not one of these people in the bike train world that go around and shame you for not wearing a helmet. Um, I think it's your choice to wear whatever sort of silly hat that you want to wear, whether it's a helmet or a hat or no hat at all. So, um, yeah, obviously like helmets are required in a lot of countries around the world. And, and if you go to one of those countries, then you'll probably have to wear a helmet unless you want to get fined. But, um, but in a lot of parts of the world, in most parts of the world, I will tell you, now that I've been to so many different countries all around the world, most people that bike, and especially that bike tour, do not wear a helmet. Um, if you look at people in Europe, for example, go to the, um, the Copenhagen Chick website and look at the people cycling around Copenhagen, one of the most bicycle-friendly cities in the whole world, 99% of those people are not wearing a helmet. Even so, I wear a helmet 99% of the time. Um, and yeah, it's just my personal choice, but I'm not really trying to push it on you either. Um, I think it's up to you, really. Um, yeah. Uh, what else, what else? <laughs> Sam Leach says, any tips on keeping clean while camping or stealth camping? Um, yeah, I mean, one of the, 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 the big differences that I have made in my recent years of bike touring is like on my earlier trips, I would get all sweaty. I was like covered in salt and stuff. And then I would camp at the end of the day with no shower or anything nearby. Um, and I made the mistake at the time of like not even trying to clean up really. I would just climb inside my sleeping bag 
and get, you know, that filth that was on my body all over my sleeping bag and everything. Um, nowadays, I, I purposely end each day with extra water on my bicycle. So like when I know that I'm getting near a campsite or something, or if I'm leaving the last town of the day, and I know that this is the, the last place that I can find water, I usually buy an extra bottle of water and I carry it on the back of my bike. And then I use that water bottle when I'm camping to clean myself, to take a little water bottle bird bath shower uh, in my campsite. And just having that, you know, even like a half, I don't know, like a cup of water, just a little bit is all you really need to wash your face off, wash your arms and legs off a little bit. That alone can make a huge difference when you're camping. So I would keep that in mind is like when you near the end of your day, try to pick up some extra water, not just to drink, but to bathe with as well. Um, James says, it's unlikely I'll ever tour in America, but meeting a corrupt, angry cop would worry me. Um, yeah, cops. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm, on, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. Um, bicycle touring, for the most part, is an activity that takes place in the street. And so you interact with, a lot of times, people that are in the street. And, and one of the types of people that are in the street are policemen, a lot of times. Um, and, and, and I can tell you, I guess, from my own experiences, that only a couple times have I maybe been confronted by a policeman in what was a potentially shady way, where I wasn't quite trustworthy of the police. Most of the time um, I, that the policemen have stopped me, that they're, they're just asking like where I'm from, what I'm doing, uh, where I'm going, that sort of a thing. I think the scariest situation that I've ever had with the police was in South Africa. Um, I was traveling alone across South Africa for about two months and I would, I re, there, were, there was a couple days in particular, like three days in a row where I would be riding along and a policeman would come up behind me and turn on their lights and pull me over basically. And this is a scary thing. Like whether you're in a car or on a bike, the police stop you in a foreign country, it's scary. But each time that they pulled me over, the, the cop would get out and he'd be like, hey, how's it going? I just wanted to ask about your trip. Like, where are you going and what are you doing, you know? but. In that moment before he confronted me, I was really, really scared because I thought, oh no, like what is going on here, you know? Um, and and it, yeah, and so this happened to me like three times in three days in South Africa where I got pulled over. And the cop was like, hey, how's it going? I just wanted to check on you and say hi. By the third time, I was like, I told the guy, I was like, you should really not do this because um, you're, you're scaring me to death when you do that, <laughs> you know? But anyways, um, yeah, most of, I've never had a, a serious confrontation um, with, the, with the police in any way that I can think of really. Um, in Romania, I was asked for my passport once by a police officer who saw me just stopped at a supermarket or something like that. And I just pretended that I didn't understand him. I didn't give him my passport or tell him where I was going or anything. And then finally, he just waved me on and said, get out of here. Um, that's really maybe the only other weird situation that I can think of in 17 years. But I don't think the police are quite as corrupt as maybe you might believe. Um, most of my experiences with the police have been positive. But like I said, I don't like it when the police approach me in any sort of way, even if they are being friendly, because it scares me. Um, I have had police, you know, pull um confront me to ask if i had enough water like i was riding in idaho up north on like a day where it was 100 degrees fahrenheit and a policeman pulled over and said hey you got enough water um i've had policemen help me and find find places to camp um in public parks even sometimes they said oh you can put your tent over here you know no problem whatever um trying to think of other times when the police have helped me out yeah, I don't know, things like that. Okay, enough about that. Uh, Richard 
says, how do you find water? Do you go into restaurants to fill up water bottles or do you buy bottles? Again, it depends on where you are in the world and what's available. Like when I was in Africa, a lot of times I was pulling water out of wells. Um, when, you know, when I was in Peru, I was buying bottled water. Uh, when I was in Norway recently, I was getting water for free from churches and cemeteries. Um, and yeah, like, and, I, and obviously like you can buy bottled water or ask for bottled water almost anywhere. Um, usually I, I would say like 90% of the time I just find a public bathroom or something and fill up my water in there. That's probably where I get most of my water from on the road. I very, very rarely buy water depending on where I am. Like I'm going to Ecuador and Colombia soon and I'm probably going to be buying water every single day, um, bottled water, um, instead of like drinking out of the tap or something because I'm not so sure it's clean. Um, but yeah, so it just depends on where you are um, and what's available. Uh, April, April says, uh, how do you manage your battery for your phone, GPS camera along the way while you trip, besides using a backup power bank? Um, that's a good question. And again, it depends on where you are and um, how far apart the resources are on your trip. Um, like I said, I just completed this three month long bike trip across Europe. And for the most part of the trip, I was staying in campgrounds or hotels. And so each and every night I would have access to power. And so um, I would just charge it, you know, I'd charge up my phone at night and then I'd have the phone or camera batteries or um, bike battery, you know, back bike light batteries. I would burn them out throughout the day and then at night I would charge them back up again. But then at the end of my trip this last summer, I rode all the way from Western Norway across to Eastern Sweden. It was a distance of about 600, 700 kilometers. And it took me about a week to cycle that distance. And for that whole length of time, I had no access to power um, along the way. And so I had to be very careful about how I used my phone, how I used my camera batteries, Etc. And and it was all just about mm, resource management. Basically, when my phone was not being used, it was off. Um, and you know, I did not leave my bike lights on for eight hours, um, or you know, or or shoot lots of video with my camera because I knew that I had a limited number of batteries um, and power to get me through this week long venture. And there's a lot of that in bike touring, not just with power but with food and water um, is like, you have to know when you're, when you're planning your trip, where you are uh, and what's around you. Like is, does this town that I'm in right now have food and water and power, internet, whatever. And where is the next place around, where is the next place on my route that I can get those things that are important. Um, so like you always want to know where, you know, where the next place to get food and water is like, especially water. Um, and and that's, a, that's a part of navigation. It's something that I talk about inside the Bicycle Turn Blueprint um, is how to plan out your route um, and get access to these resources. Anyways, um, back to your question about power. I have used a solar panel in the past, which I really enjoyed um, and, and still use on occasion. Uh, I did not use it on my last trip and I'm not gonna be using it on my trip to Ecuador and Colombia. Once again, because I know that I am going to have access to electricity on a regular basis once I get out to Ecuador and Colombia, because um, I'm going to be staying in cheap hotels. Um, but if I were doing something more remote, I would probably bring my solar panel to charge my electronics. There are, all, there are also hubs, um, bicycle hubs that are built into your wheel that generate power as you ride. And this is another way that you can power your electronics when you're out there on the road. Like I know a lot of people now use Strava or using Google Maps or some other app, uh, mapping application to navigate their route. And that very, very quickly drains your battery. One of the best ways to keep that battery charged while you ride throughout the day is to use one of these dynamo hubs is what they're called, uh, hubs that power your electronics, like a small electronics, a GPS, uh, smartphone, etc. 
and um, they are expensive, I will tell you that, and they add a little bit of weight um, to your bicycle, but it's one of the best ways to power uh, your bike out there on the road. And I, I think I'm going to get a new bike next year, actually, and I'm probably going to have that Dynamo power generating hub built into my front wheel so that I can power my smartphone and stuff while I'm out there on the road. Um, okay, only a few more questions, guys, because I've already gone way over schedule today. Um, but I want to answer as many questions as I possibly can, so I'm willing to stick around here. Uh, Sam says, how do you dry your clothes after washing them? Whoops. Washing? Yeah, I just hang them up. That's it. Uh, hang them in the sun. And, you know, like, again, like, if, if it's rainy and, and wet outside and cold, I obviously will not wash my clothes on that particular day because I know that there's like little to no chance of them drying overnight. Um, you wait for good weather and then you wash and dry your clothes. Um, yeah, uh, that's another reason maybe like if you know that you want to wash your clothes on a particular day, you probably want to cycle a shorter distance and get to camp a little bit earlier so that you have the time to wash the clothes and hang them up while the sun is still in the sky. Um, these are the sorts of logistical things that the more you bike tour, the more you think about these little, they're little, they're, they're little things, but they become big when you're out there on a, on a trip. Like you get to camp, you want to wash your clothes, but now it's dark, you know, like that's not the best situation to be in. Anyways, okay, that's what you do. Uh, but if you watch, um, there's a recent video I just did, like a, a campsite tour of how I set up my camp. Um, it's probably, if you go back on Bicycle Turn Pro, you'll see it. But I was camping in northern Spain. I give you a little tour of my campsite. And you'll see in there I talk about how I hang my clothes on top of my tent or on top of my bicycle. Um, I've also strung a uh, string across the inside of my tent so I can hang clothes over me while I'm sleeping. And that's, that I've found is one of the best ways to dry your clothes overnight. Okay, uh, Attila says, hi Darren, when do you plan to come to Berlin, Germany? Um, I don't know, I've been there twice, I've been to Berlin twice, and I was just there not too long ago, maybe a year and a half ago or something like that. Um, I was there for Christmas actually, Christmas, yeah, Christmas day. Yeah, Christmas day, like two years ago. So, um, Anyways, yeah, I want to go back and I want to practice learning my German. Mein Deutsch ist sehr schrecklich. Um, yeah. Uh, Peter says, what's better, Dynamo Hub or solar panel? I don't know, um, because each one has its drawbacks, I guess. Like, the Dynamo Hub is good because it's built into your bicycle and yeah, there's no like extra piece to carry or anything. Whereas a solar panel is like this extra thing that you have to strap on and manage. Um, both of them add extra weight to your bike. And I don't know if one necessarily works better than the other. Obviously the solar panel, you have to have good lighting. It's gotta be angled in the correct way or whatever. So I would probably say the Dynamo Hub is better than a solar panel, but um, solar panel is probably a cheaper, easier option for most people. The Dynamo Hub is not is not easy to install, and it's not cheap. Um, Andrew says, hi, Darren, are you cycling in Europe next year? What part and when are you going? Yes, after I complete my Ecuador and Colombia trip this year, because um, I'm, I'm starting next week, I'm going to Ecuador, and I'll be coming back from Colombia in late February. Um, back to the United States, then I'll be here for a couple months, two months or so. Then I am flying back to Sweden. I'm going to northern Sweden, back to Umeå, Sweden, which is where I finished my bike tour last year. And I'm going to stay in Umeå, I think, for like two months maybe, um, just doing some work there and doing some cycling around the area. And I want to, I don't know if this will actually happen, but I want to ride my bike from Umeå, Sweden, across to Finland and then down to St. Petersburg, Russia. That's the ride that I want to do. Um, but like I said earlier in the, in the webinar here, I have to get a visa 
in order to go to Russia, and I don't have that yet, and I don't know yet how I'm going to do that. It's something I'm going to plan when I get back from Colombia, but that is kind of my plans for next year. But that will be in, oh uh, gosh, like June, July, August, sometime around then. That's when I'll be in Europe, and that's where I'll be. Um, Swapnil says, why do you wear a cap during your videos? Uh, like this, like right now, why am I wearing a cap? Because I uh, look funny with a shaved head? I don't know. Because <laughs> it's just, it's a piece of cloth on my head. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what you're asking. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Richard says, have you ever been near a war zone or a dangerous reason, re, region like the Middle East or parts of Africa? And how have you guided yourself around them or through them? Yes, I've been um, to several dangerous areas, actually, while dangerous things were going on. Um, the first thing that comes to mind, although maybe not that dangerous, was I was in Athens, Greece during the riots when they were going on there when buildings were being burnt down and stuff. There were riot police all on every corner of the street, practically. Um, and I was there at that time. And uh, I witnessed gangs of people with baseball bats chasing the police through the city and stuff. Um, that was probably one of the most crazy things I've seen on my trips. But again, the, the conflict there, and just like the conflict in so many parts of the world, um, is between usually certain individuals uh, or certain groups. And as a bike tourist, I am not usually a part of any of those groups, right? And the locals know that um, just because of the way I look and act and I'm on a silly bicycle. Um, and so, yeah, like same, and that was the case like in Athens, like literally my first day in Greece, I was in Thessaloniki, Greece. This was not in Athens, but in Thessaloniki, and um, like 200 people with baseball bats came running down the street, and, and in front of them were about six police officers running for their lives, basically, wearing full riot gear. Um, they were completely outnumbered, and, and they all ran just straight past me, right on the road. Like, I pulled over and just watched as, you know, a whole parade of people went running past. And, and that has been how all of the dangerous situations that I've ever been in have been like. It's like I am just a fly on the wall, a spectator, as stuff happens around me. Um, the other dangerous thing, I, I don't want to scare you by telling all these stories, but they are kind of interesting, right? Um, I was in Africa. I don't want to say where necessarily, but um, like you've probably seen like these stereotypical images or videos of there's like six black guys with machine guns sitting in the back of like a white pickup truck and they're just going down the road like a gang of of guys you know with machine guns or you know rifles or whatever all on their back and um so i was in this one town in africa and uh there was only one street that went through the middle of town. And the street was incredibly uh, busy. Like there were cars and trucks and people just everywhere. But when, um, it's hard to explain. I, I, I got to the front of the street and I was asking somebody for directions. I was trying to find a road that went through or whatever. Um, and so I pulled up on the curb and I tapped this guy on the shoulder. I don't know why I tapped him out of it. any, there were thousands of people on the street. I tapped this one guy on the shoulder. He turns around, he's got three guns, like one gun in his, in his pant pocket, one gun in his vest and like a, and a rifle in his hand. And then two of his friends that he was talking to at the time, they turn around and they got, one guy's got a machine gun on his back, another one's got a gun on him. I realized in an instant that these guys are like gangsters. And, and um, for like a split second, I was very, very scared. But, but, um, but these people, these guys who on the surface looked very, very scary, were like some of the nicest people that I met on my entire trip in Africa. Super friendly. Um, they were interested in my trip, like asking all about it, blah, blah, blah. Um, 
and they did not care anything about me other than they were interested in where I was from and where I was going and um, you know what I was doing in their town, et cetera. Um, the fact that they were armed and ready for a fight um, had nothing to do with me. And that's and that I think is like I, I have a lot of stories like that maybe where um, you know on the surface things look dangerous, but in reality for you as a bike tourist, as an outsider, it's probably not. Um, hopefully. One of the things, like, I was talking about fears earlier um, in the webinar, and, and I talk about that inside the Bicycle Parent Blueprint. In fact, it's one of the things that I mentioned right at the beginning of the book, is that, like, even though I would like to say, you know, even though I have said that, like, I've never had anything seriously bad go wrong to me um, during my experiences on the road, Bad things can happen, and, and bike touring is a potentially dangerous and deadly activity. Like, you can get hurt, and you can die doing a bike tour. Um, it's extremely uncommon, but it does happen. And I wish that weren't the case, um, but I think it's worth mentioning. Like, I, I, it would be unethical of me to pretend that, you know, or to tell you that go out there and you have nothing to worry about blah 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 so anyways I just wanted to say that um, you know yeah <laughs> okay I'm gonna do one more question give me a good one guys and then I'm gonna sign off um, okay Brandon says Brandon Swain says best one month route in the United States in the US I have cycled across the United States six times. I've not done every route in the United States, nor have I done every route in the world. Um, but uh, I have done six routes across the United States, up, down, left, right. And in my opinion, the best route in the United States is the Pacific Coast route that goes from Vancouver, Canada, down to the Mexican border, uh, along through Washington, Oregon, and California. That, in my opinion, blows the other routes completely out of the water. Um, a lot of people, the most popular route in America is probably the Trans Am route, which goes across the United States from east to west. And I think it's more popular just because of the um, wow factor. People want to say that they have biked, you know, from all the way across the United States. Having done that route, or I actually haven't done that entire route, I've done major parts of it, but having done major parts of that route, I think the Trans-American route is quite boring in comparison to the Pacific Coast route. Yes, it does allow you to see maybe different parts of the country, but there are huge, vast stretches that are boring, very boring. Um, Kansas, Wy Southern Wyoming, you just want to poke your eyes out because you've seen so much flat pra prairie land. Um, <laughs> and it goes on for days and days and days when you're on a bicycle. So, um, yeah, I would not do, I would not want to do the Trans American route again, having done it. Um, but I would totally do the Pacific Coast route again. So that's what I'd say. Uh, I did the East Coast, you know, I, I should mention the East Coast. Um, route which is because i know a lot of people are interested in the east as well um which that that route takes you through washington dc and virginia and all the way up into maine and on the outer banks of north carolina islands and stuff like that and that's a good route as well i think the difference is the east route it, you're you're in cities a lot more you're on higher traffic roads um and there's a lot more navigation on the East Coast route. Like, there's a lot of turns that you have to make. The Pacific Coast route is nice because, for the most part, you're on just a couple roads. You don't have to think too much about navigation. The campgrounds and accommodations are spaced out just perfectly um, on the Pacific Coast route. And obviously, the scenery is spectacular. There's redwood forests and amazing beaches in California and Oregon and Washington. Um, yeah, it's just great. And there's a lot of bike tourists on that route as well, the Pacific Coast route, 
whereas the East Coast route, there's it's uh, far fewer people doing that, so it's very it's less likely you'll run into other bike tourists. Pacific Coast route has a community of people, usually every summer, that are riding that route. So if you're a solo person, a man, woman, um, and you don't want to travel alone, I would really consider the Pacific Coast route of the United States because it allows you so easily to connect and ride with other bike tourists. Anyways, that's it. Um, I think I'm gonna call it right here, guys, because I've gone for an hour and a half. Um, this is over what I was planning to do. But um, thank you so much. Gosh, there, I see your other questions here. Do you guys want me to keep talking, or do you want, or should I stop? I can I could go for another half hour if you want me to. Um, I just don't want to bore you to death with all my silly stories. Um, let me know. Do you want me to keep going, or or should we call it? Carol says yes. Keep going. Okay. Cool. Keep talking. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. I go for a little bit longer because um, I see your questions and I want to answer them. Um. <laughs> I'm sorry for butchering your name. Swap Nil says, how did you convince your mom to allow you to, to do bicycle touring? Actually, I mean, now that I'm 33 years old, that seems like a funny question. But um, when I, excuse me, when I first started bicycle touring, I was 17 years old. And yes, I had some fears about bike touring and my parents had some fears about me doing my bike tours as well. Um, the way that I was able to convince my parents to let me go on my first bike trip was twofold, well, threefold, really. One, I did research on my route, and I showed that to my parents to say, hey, other people are doing this route. I think I can do this route. Um, you know, here's where I'll, where I'll be staying and what I'll be doing, blah, blah, blah. So I did the research. That's the first thing. Second of all, I tried to prove myself to my parents that I could do a bike trip like this. So before I went off and did my first bike trip, I did several shorter, closer to home train trips. Um, I would ride maybe, I'd get my mom actually to drop me off like 60 miles away from home, and then I would ride back home. That was like the first thing that I did to train for my trip. Then uh, later, I don't know, a couple weeks later or something, I had my mom drop me off 150 miles away from home. And over the course of three days, like a weekend, I rode back home. Again, proving, okay, I did the first 50 or 60 mile ride. Now I did 150 miles. Who's to say I can't do 1,000, right? And so I did my research. I proved myself. And then third, my parents really didn't want me to go alone at age 17. And so they wanted me to have somebody to go with me. And so I recruited some of my friends. I had three of my best friends from high school join me for different legs of my first bike tour. I didn't have any single person ride with me for the whole trip, but I had three different people ride with me for different legs of the trip. So for each leg of my trip, my thousand mile trip, I had one person riding with me at all times. And that's the main thing that allowed me or my parents to overcome their fear of having me go off on this bike tour all by myself. So those are the three things I did. And on Bicycle Train Pro, I have an article titled, How to Convince Your Parents to Let You Go on a Bike Tour. And I also talk about that inside the Bicycle Train Blueprint. Okay. Um, yeah. Castaway says, do you have a web page for your subscribers or network to network with each other and create rides? No, I've thought about that, of, of doing that. Um, I just haven't. And maybe I will in 2017. Maybe, I, you know, maybe now is the time. You know, I think the reason I haven't done something like that is I was afraid to create it and then have nobody use it. But I think now that Bicycle Train Pro has grown to such a point um, that maybe now would be a good time for people to use it. Um, 
Katie says, what is your opinion of east to west or west to east routes given the prevailing winds in the plains on a more northern or on a normal uh, on a more northern route? Are you asking about like the northern tier route or something? Uh, I'm not sure. When I rode across the Trans-American route, I rode from east to west and the wind was not um, coming from for the most part, was not coming from my front or from my back. It was coming from the side, from the south. Um, and, and there were times when it was really windy, like really, really windy. Um, but the wind was, for the most part, coming from the side. And uh, yeah, so I guess it didn't really matter too much which way you were going. I would say, however, that most of the, the, like when you cycle across country, you run into a lot of other bike tourists. And most of the other cyclists that I ran into were going from east to west. Now, I do know that some people go west to east or whatever, but um, yeah, in my experience, east to west is good. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's all I have to say. Uh, Yeah, Christopher says, like, do you think it's safe for people of color to cycle around the United States with a racist president? Uh, I kind of talked about that a little bit before when I was saying, like, I don't know because I am not of color and I do not know exactly um, what it's like out there, to be honest. You know, you maybe as a person of color knows better than I do what it's like, sadly. Um, I wish it, I, I'd like to say it's not a problem, but it might be. Um, and yeah, the whole Donald Trump thing right now that's going on is very interesting. I mean, from an international, I don't want to necessarily um, get too political here or anything, but I view myself as an international citizen, not necessarily a citizen of the United States, but a citizen of the world. And for that reason, um, I think it's very disturbing that, um, yeah, that we now have a president that has such wrong, negative feelings about minorities and people of color, et cetera. Um, yeah, I think it's just messed up. And, it makes me embarrassed to be an American traveling around the world right now, to be honest. Um, I think my trip this year might be a little bit different than in previous years, you know? And, and I, one of the things that like I've, I've realized over the years is like people all around the world know about the United States. Like they know what's going on here. Like they aren't clueless. Um, and even, you know, people in Africa, that I would run into, I would say, I would, they would say like, where are you from? And I'd say, I'm from the United States. And the first thing they'd say is like, oh, President Obama, you know? And, and, and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, President Obama. Um, you know, they, they know who our president is, but they don't even maybe necessarily know where we are on a map, you know? Anyways, uh, it's all very interesting and scary and yeah. Um, I don't know what else to say. I don't want to get too into it, but yeah. Um, yeah. Wawa 1013 says, I've, I've wondered why I see a lot of touring cyclists using drop bars rather than trekking bars. Is there a reason? I find trekking bars more comfortable myself. I talked about that earlier, actually, when I was talking about mountain bikes with the flat bars. Um, versus the different types of handlebars that are on touring bikes. It's all about being able to move your hands around. Again, check out my book, The Essential Guide to Touring Bicycles. I talk all about that. Um, I'm trying to see if I can, I don't know. Anyways, check the book out um, or go back in the video and watch that section because I've already talked about that a little bit. Um, what else? Uh, Ian, Ian McComb says, interested to know, will you ever do a circumnavigation of the world? Yeah, so will I ever ride completely around the world in one go? I don't think I will ever do that. Um, I, a lot of people 
you know, that, that have done long distance bike touring like I have done over the last 17 years have either done their trip in one big go, like Alistair Humphreys, for example, who spent four years cycling around the world and he's written two books about his trip. Um, he did his trip essentially in one big go. Uh, I, on the other hand, and many people like me, have broken their world travels up into smaller trips. So I travel for three months, six months, nine months, two years at a time, and then I go back home for a little bit, and then I go on some other trip. Um, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm do you know, earlier this year, I went, I did three months in Europe, then I did a month up in Alaska, and now I'm going to do a three-month trip in South America. So... I like to break it up a little bit. Um, and I don't think I, I would necessarily ever do the circumnavigation trip around the world. I think a lot of people that do do that, do that for one of two reasons. One, they're limited on time. Like a lot of people say like, I'm, I'm gonna take a year off of work and I'm gonna ride around the world. Um, and I get that, that's totally good. The other group of people uh, go around the world to prove something, either to themselves or to others. Um, I know a young woman that just rode around the world, um, a young black woman actually, and um, and she did it purposely because she wanted to be the youngest woman to ever cycle around the world. Like that was her goal. Um, yeah, and so like there's at the beginning of this webinar, I talked about the different reasons that people go bike touring the motivations for different people to do different trips. Um, I am not motivated personally by saying, I rode my bike around the world versus I rode my bike for 17 years around the world um, in different ways. You know, Most people, I think, don't really care. Um, I realized after my third trip, like my third long distance bike tour, I stopped keeping track of how many miles I had ridden because I realized that everything after 10,000 miles or whatever is just a big number. And and if I tell you or anyone else on the street, like, oh, I've ridden 250,000 miles or I've ridden 300,000 miles, nobody cares. Like, it's just a big number. Um, and that's kind of the way that I feel about, um, like, setting records and stuff like that. It's, it's not for me, but it might be for you. Like, I'm just not motivated by it, but maybe you are. And if you are, that's awesome. Uh, Brandon says, when is the Alaska footage coming out? I'm not sure, probably in January, because I just finished, like yesterday, finishing all of the footage that I shot in Europe this past summer. Um, I created over 100 videos while I was in Europe, just in the last three months. It took a huge amount of time and effort to edit all the, that footage, and now I've finished the Europe stuff. I'm going to do the Alaska stuff next. And then I'm off to Ecuador and Colombia where I'm gonna create even more content. Ah. So you'll probably be seeing my Alaska stuff in January, I'm guessing. All of my Europe stuff, I'm releasing three new videos from Europe uh, each week here on my Bicycle Turn Pro YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe to the channel. You don't wanna miss it um, and see all those videos. I think, you know, I've started just recently creating video blogs from my trip and I'm kicking myself now for not creating them earlier because, gosh, it would be so amazing to have videos from my bike tours in Africa and Asia and South America, et cetera. I don't have video from any of that um, at the moment because uh, I've only just started making these video blogs last year, really. Um, but um, it is really cool now that I've created almost 150 different video blogs to be able to share my trip with you guys to so that you can see different parts of the world very quickly. Like you wanna see my video from Ukraine or Romania, like you just Google Bicycle Turn Pro Romania and you'll see, you'll see a great part of the country. Um, and yeah, Norway, Sweden, Spain, like as I go along, I'm collecting these places and sharing them with you. In the videos too, like if you guys are new here to Bicycle Turn Pro and you haven't watched a lot of my previous videos, um, you might want to go back and do so because in the videos I not only show you like different parts of the world and stuff, but I slowly, I kind of sprinkle 
like my secrets to bicycle touring success throughout the video. So in one video, I might show you how I pack up my camp. Um, another video, I might share with you some um, psychological secret that I use to, to keep going for months on end. Um, I might talk about how I meet people and make friends and along the road. All of that stuff is kind of littered, scattered throughout my various uh, videos that are now here on Bicycle Turn Pro's YouTube channel. And like I said, there are now over 400 videos on the channel, so lots of information out there for you guys. In addition to the 1,200 articles I've written about bike touring on BicycleTurnPro.com and the books that I've written. One, two, three, four, uh, lots of stuff there. If you guys are interested in the books, um, this is you know, the one that you want to get if you're interested in planning your own bike tour, like a lot of these questions that you guys are asking today are covered in great detail inside the Bicycle Train Blueprint. Um, this is a 400 page book, 405 or so, 412 pages. Um, it's like a textbook. It's like, it's like the textbook that you want to read before you go off on a big bicycle train adventure. If you're planning a self-supported trip, this is the one for you. Christopher is saying he bought all the books. Thanks, Christopher. Um, I hope it's helped in some way. Um, but yeah, like this is the number one resource that I would recommend if you're planning a bike trip. Um, if you're looking for a new bike, this is the one that you want to read. It's called The Essential Guide to Touring Bicycles. And both of these books can be found on the BicycleTouringPro.com website. Just go to BicycleTourningPro.com and click on the How To Resources button, and all of them are there. So um, yeah, the books are available worldwide. They ship, I ship them every single day all over the world, like no matter what country you're in. Uh, they've gone to Brazil and Argentina and uh, Aruba and Indonesia and Australia, New Zealand, Japan, China. Um, Germany, tons go to Germany, tons go to France, tons go to the UK. Um, yeah, probably UK is like, is really big. Um, America, Canada, all over the place. So uh, yes, they're available everywhere. They're available not only as paperback books, but also as eBooks. So um, yeah, uh, I think I'm going to call it, guys. Um, I, I know there's still more questions and comments, and I could probably go for 10 hours answering questions here, um, but my voice is starting to wear. So, um, and we've almost been going for two hours now. So thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you learned a little bit of uh, something. I hope I inspired you in some way. Um, and I hope that any fears that you might have do not prevent you from conducting the bike tour of your dreams. Um, I think that one of the greatest things that I've done in my life is confront some of the fears that I've had uh, and with my bicycle train adventures. And I hope that you will get out there and see the world. It, it can be a scary place, but I think once you get out there, you realize that the world is much more friendly than, than the news and, and maybe our new president might make it out to be. So um, thank you so much. Um, again, uh, check out my website, bicycletrainpro.com. Grab a copy of the Bicycle Turn Blueprint if you haven't to already. Uh, subscribe to Bicycle Turn Pro's YouTube channel. Send me an email, message, comment anytime um, if I can help you in any way. And if you see me out on the road, make sure you say hello. Uh, we can grab a selfie or something together. So that'd be cool. All right. Thanks, guys, so much. Um, and adios. I got to practice my Spanish now, right? Because I'm going to South America. Adios, amigos. All right, how do I hang up now? <laughs> okay, got to figure this out. Where did my screen go? Ah, here we are. Okay, bye guys. Thank you so much. See you later. Have a good day. Bye.